Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm just going to keep doing that teacher thing where I keep talking until everyone is paying attention. <laughs> no, uh, good e I, welcome everyone to Loyola Marymount University and to the Amundsen Auditorium. Uh, thank you for joining us for this 11th annual Mary Milligan Lecture. We're excited. <laughs> We are delighted to be gathering together both here in the Amundsen Auditorium on the LMU campus, but also across the country and probably across the world via our live stream. So welcome to everybody online as well. Welcome to all. We want to begin by recognizing that the land we sit on is territory seized from the Tongva peoples, who in the face of settler colonialism continue to claim their place and act as stewards to these lands and waters as they have for thousands of years. Let us take a moment to reflect upon what, that, what it might mean to take responsibility for our presence here. As we on the committee reflected on this, we decided as a small, but let's be honest, wholly inadequate gesture to make a donation to the Sacred Places Institute, a local indigenous-led group that works with native nations and indigenous people, including Tongwa leaders, to protect sacred sites and advance environmental justice. Uh, regarding the live stream process, I just want to let those present in the room know that the camera is focused up here on the stage. Um, so what our friends and colleagues see at home right now is mostly me. Um, and fortunately, I am having a good hair day. My name is Brad Hoover, uh, Associate Professor of Practical Theology here at LMU, representing the, the uh, Mary Milligan Lecture Committee. The Mary Milligan Lecture Series started in 2013 to create a forum for critical reflection on spirituality in service to the church, the academy, and the world, and in keeping with the charism of the religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary, so that all may have life and have it to the full. The series also honors the, Mary of Sister, the memory of Sister Mary Milligan and her own work in service to the church, the world, and the academy, including her many years here at LMU as a professor of theological studies and also as our dean and provost. We are grateful to the religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary for endowing this lecture that gives us a unique opportunity to reflect together on scholarship relevant to spirituality but with a wider audience and in light of contemporary issues. The world needs this kind of thing, doesn't it? Right? Yeah. In, a mo in this moment where our world is torn apart by violent conflict in places like Gaza, Ukraine, Sudan, when fear-mongering, inequality, and polarizing divisions zap our energies here at home, at the, very mo at the moment when our very planet sometimes is crying out to us, we are fortunate that one of our founding and sponsoring communities saw fit to create this sacred time and space for us to think together. Spirituality and spiritual practice have long sustained human communities, especially in difficult times, binding us together, giving us hope, and showing us the way toward a life in abundance. According to our speaker for tonight, it was the spirituality of the man from Assisi, St. Francis and his companions, that offered a transformative vision of hope and abundant life to an imaginative group of scholars eight centuries ago. She is convinced that vision redounds through the ages and offers us tools to confront our time's challenges that we need, as your title reminds us, to reclaim Assisi once again. Before we introduce our speaker to take us on that journey, I invite us to appreciate those who prepared this sacred time and space for us including the diligent behind the scenes work of many who are not gonna appear on the stage. That includes the Mary Milligan Lecture Committee made up of my theological studies colleagues, Faith Sevilla, Tracy T. Meyer, and committee chair, Leila Karst. So if you see them, thank them. <laughs> Thanks are also due to our other colleagues here at LMU, including Allison Mullen, Associate Director for Academic Communications at the Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts. Tony Yost, the Senior Director of Development for BCLA, as well as the Events Management staff, Information Technology Services, Facilities Management, who maintains spaces like this for us, and the Sodexo staff, whose tasty handiwork we will be sampling afterward. That's the food. 
Thanks to our videography, video, videographer, Justin Hornick, who is capturing this evening's event for our live stream, and our student photographer, Will Grzebski. And finally, thank you to student workers who welcomed us and performed various tasks, seen and unseen, especially graduate assistants, Daria Jones and Hannah Loper. It takes a village, no? Thank you to our theological studies faculty and students who are here supporting the event tonight. And we'd also like to thank the BCLA Dean's Office, our Dean Robin Crabtree, and incoming Dean Richard Fox for their continued support of this series. It is also our custom on this evening to recognize the family and friends of Sister Mary Milligan, especially tonight, Jerry Justo and Susan Moley, who are joining us via live stream, and all the RSHM sisters who are with us this evening virtually or, or here present. How many uh, RSHM sisters do we have? Could we, yeah, thank you. Let's. Let's thank them. Uh, without you, uh, we would literally not be doing this at all, and certainly not doing it year after year. For our new, newer guests, the Religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary are one of the three founding and sponsoring orders of the university. Without their vision, charism, and leadership, we would not be Loyola Marymount. That merger of Loyola University and of Los Angeles and Marymount College happened a half century ago last July. And we celebrate how that brought together our three sponsoring orders and their heritages. Added to Loyola's Ignatian tradition was the rich heritage of the arts at Marymount College. Just count how many of those little Ignite posters have arts connections. And the call of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange to imagine a reconciled world. And let's face it, what kind of an impoverished thing would this university be in 2024 if it were still just a bunch of dudes hanging around? <laughs> Speaking of dudes making way for others, <laughs> please allow me to invite Dr. Lainey Beauvais to the stage to introduce our speaker. Dr. Beauvais is the only alum of LMU, I learned, to also have graduated from the two merging entities, Marymount College and Loyola University of LA. I think there's also a Pepperdine degree in there somewhere, right? Yeah, okay. She has taught at every level of education from elementary to higher ed, and from 1987 to 2022, was Senior Vice President for Student Affairs here at LMU. I also recently learned that she is a trustee at another Catholic university, which happens to be the institution of my wife, Mount St. Mary's. There are many, many honors and awards and leadership roles in higher ed Laney, but let me just present to you Dr. Laney Beauvais. When I was vice president, uh, senior vice president of student affairs, I used to always start by saying, go Lions. Uh, so maybe we can do that again, even though it's a very sacred event today. Go Lions! <laughs> All right, there we go. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Hoover. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's good to be with you. Before I introduce the speaker this evening, I'd like to share a few personal uh, notes with you and to do so in the Jesuit tradition of three points. The first point <clears throat> has to do with the 50-year celebration of the merger of Marymount College and Loyola University. Like many mergers and marriages, it had its rocky moments. But happily, there was no divorce. And after 50 years of being LMU, it has become a model for integrating two separate institutions while still honoring and celebrating the three sponsoring traditions that came together to form this wonderful Catholic institution of higher learning. And of course, you can't talk about the merger without talking about its name. Many of us here know the story, but I thought it was worth retelling. The story begins at the last merger meeting where the representatives were finalizing all the details. The Marymount College representative was Mother uh, Peter Damien, Dr. Renee Harang, to many of you. She comes out of the meeting to meet with Mother Raymond McKay, the president of Marymount College, to update her on the negotiations. She says to Mother Raymond, 
We've come to an agreement on all the issues. All of the pieces you wanted have been agreed to, except one. Mother Raymond says, terrific. <clears throat> Which item is in contention? Mother Peter Damon calmly says, the name of the institution. They want the name to be Loyola University. Mother Raymond, equally calm, says, go back into that room and do not come out until it, the name is Loyola Marymount University. And tonight, here we are celebrating <laughs> Loyola Marymount University and 50 years. My second point is Mary Milligan. What an honor it is for me to be here celebrating the life and work of Sister Mary Milligan. When I met her in 1965, she was Mother Bernard Mary, and she was my Old Testament professor. What a remarkable woman she was. She was smart, gracious, strong, and quietly charismatic. She led a full and interesting life, teacher, theologian, superior general, dean of the Bellarmine College. And I had the joy of having her as my mentor and calling her my friend. <clears throat> and I wear red in her memory. My third and last comment here has to do with LMU. I came to this campus in 1968 as a senior at Marymount College and have spent much of my adult life here. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have watched LMU mature and blossom over its 50 years of existence. LMU is a very special place. And in my view, its secret sauce, if you will, is exactly what we are celebrating tonight. Its mission, its Catholicity, and the three rich tra traditions of the founding orders, all giving LMU profound meaning and substance. It is a special place indeed. And speaking of meaning and substance, let's proceed to the keynote speaker. It is a real privilege of mine to be able to introduce a long-standing colleague and friend one of LMU's own as tonight's speaker, Sister Mary Beth Ingham of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange. To speak of Sister Mary Beth is to tell a story about transformative teaching and learning here at, at, at LMU. Sister Mary Beth started her long career at LMU as an undergraduate, studying French and philosophy in the heady days after the merger. After her graduate studies, Dr. Ingham, returned to LMU and taught in the Department of Philosophy for 25 years, where she served as chair and is now Professor Emerita. During that time, she received LMU's coveted presidential award, the Fitz B. Burns Teaching Medal. She is a member of the Board of Trustees, where she champions the mission of the university. And she is currently the congregational leader of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange one of our three, one of LMU's three founding and sponsoring religious orders. Well, Sister Mary Beth is deeply connected to the Ignatian, Marymount, and CSJ traditions. She is here tonight because of her connections and understanding of the Franciscan tradition of the Middle Ages. She holds a doctorate in medieval philosophy from the University of Freiburg in Switzerland. She is best known as a scholar for her work on the 13th century Franciscan philosopher and theologian, Blessed John Duns Scotus. She is the author or editor of several books and articles about Scotus, including the co-editor of the first volume of Duns Scotus, Philosopher, published for the 800th anniversary of his death. Author of the work on his ethics called The Harmony of Goodness, and author of Duns Scotus' work titled To Amuse, Scotus for Dunces, An Introduction to the Subtle Doctor. <laughs> when Dr. Ingham retired as professor of philosophical theology at the Franciscan School of Theology, that is after she retired from LMU and before becoming the congressional leader, congregational leader, the Franciscans presented her with her own Franciscan habit which is just about the highest honor you can get from the boys in brown. <laughs> so tonight, 
we are not only hearing from someone who has an expansive knowledge of the early centuries of the Franciscan intellectual tradition, but also from someone who has a deep love for the spirituality of that tradition. It is a spirituality of beauty, conversion, and creation that continues to captivate millions of people, including our Pope who took the founder's name. We are fortunate and delighted to have Sister Mary Beth Ingham here tonight as our annual Mary Milligan RSHM lecturer in spirituality, speaking to us about reclaiming Assisi, the transformative power of spiritual identity. Please welcome Sister Mary Beth Ingham. Well, they're a tough act to follow, aren't they? <laughs> well, it's a, truly a great honor for me to be with you this evening to celebrate the life and work of Sister Mary Milligan, RSHM, and to reflect with you upon the significance of spirituality in our life today. In my work as a historian of medieval philosophy, I've come to recognize the power and influence of spiritual identity in the lives of the great masters, medieval philosophers and theologians whose writings give evidence of their own spiritual identity. Nowhere is this clearer to me than in the transformation of thought that took place in the Franciscans of the 13th century. So this evening, I thought we could take a careful look at how Franciscan identity and spirituality affected the reflection and the debate within a particular religious order at a particular moment in history. I emphasize the particular here because where spirituality is concerned, particularity matters. Spiritual concerns are at heart existential concerns. They address the deeper human questions, such as identity, vocation, the meaning of life, and the possibility of a future life. All these questions spring from our spiritual selves, ourselves both rational and emotional. And as we shall see, at a most particular moment in the first, first century of the Franciscan order, the intellectual inquiry about identity gave birth to a new vision of what it means to be human, what it means to be rational, and what it means to be capable of transcending limitations. In other words, what it means to be free. Not keeping this vision to themselves, the friars extend their vision of what it means to be human to all persons, believers and non-believers alike. As I hope to show, this consideration of spiritual influence has implications for us today as persons of faith, as scholars, academics, students who seek the service of faith and promotion of justice. At the close of my presentation, after we consider the Franciscan case, I shall suggest several ways that we might learn how to appropriate and deepen our own spiritual identity, spiritual commitments, and way of life. So what does it mean to consider the power and influence of spirituality on the intellectual life? In Jean Leclerc's classic study, The Love of Learning and the Desire for God, the Benedictine scholar presented his principal insight, that the intellectual ascent to truth and ultimately to wisdom plays a central role in the spiritual journey toward union with God. Throughout the centuries, scholars were grounded in a twofold love, that of learning and that of the divine. 
intellectual questions are themselves self-transcending rational activities. For they point beyond themselves to a greater reality whose contours are suspected but not fully grasped. As such, the so-called ultimate questions, the meaning of life, the nature of evil, the nature of God, and the possibility of immortality, are both rational and spiritual questions that point to the existence of answers we may not yet see clearly. Here at LMU, this insight informs the Catholic intellectual tradition, where reason and faith journey together, informing our intellectual project of educating the whole person. Rational inquiry is dynamic. It manifests itself and develops through moments of certainty, of risk, of trust, and conviction. Authentic rational inquiry possesses a level of particularity and existential urgency. My inquiry matters to me. Hopefully, I do not isolate the operations of my intellect from other experiences, especially my emotional experiences. Now, this way of understanding the rational spiritual cuts at the heart of the ivory tower image of the scholar. And the case study we're about to explore makes this, I believe, abundantly clear. So let's turn now to a case study that reveals the transformative power of a spiritual tradition for intellectual inquiry. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you of what most histories of medieval thought present. So the dominant historical narrative about the 13th century casts the period as one of debate and even crisis between reason and faith. On the side of reason, we find Aristotle, whose texts entered Western Europe beginning in the 5th century and reached an apex in the 12th century and the 13th. On the side of faith, we have Augustine, the authority no medieval scholar dared to ignore. And toward the end of the 13th century, things came to a dramatic head with several condemnations of Aristotle's philosophy by the Bishop of Paris. For many historians, the century, the 13th century, was a period of conflict between reason and faith. The key to understanding any medieval thinker, they hold, is to identify which side of the reason-faith debate they're on. This is a simple narrative and one that is extremely easy to tell. But is it enough? At the close of her important study on 13th century ethics, Professor Bonnie Kent challenged historians of philosophy to enlarge the context and expand the narrative within which they consider how medieval thinkers developed their insights on key human questions. She held that a larger context informs a different reading of the project of philosophical reflection and its history. And in particular, Kant criticized the common narrative of Aristotle versus Augustine as the solution to any philosophical question. While offering a dramatic lens, the narrative fails to account for what we find in the texts themselves. So what do we find in the texts themselves? Now we're entering the gripping part of my talk. <laughs> I think it's gripping. Early in the 13th century, texts dealing with human freedom focus on the term free choice in the will. And the text used the Latin liberum arbitrium. But by the end of the century, 
the same sorts of texts turn to the affirmation of freedom of the will. And here, the terms change to libertas voluntatis. This shift in terminology, minor though it might be, is significant, and it reveals a deeper conceptual transformation. Now, most historians identify the shift within the emergence of a more radical concept of freedom, made possible by the emancipation of reason from faith. Ooh. Right. <laughs> In this explanation, some target the Franciscans directly. And you knew this was where I was going. They target men like John Dun Scotus and William of Ockham as introducing the beginning of the end of Western history and of the harmony between faith and reason. So tonight, I want to follow Bonnie Kent's suggestion by focusing our attention elsewhere and creating another narrative. I want to focus on an important debate within Franciscan circles in the 13th century, namely the growing tension over evangelical poverty. Now, the Latin term, and I'll refer to this as we go, but the Latin term is usus pauper, or poor use. In the case study that I'll present, I propose that we look to the more internal, concrete, particular, and existential Franciscan debate of the 13th century. Literally, a crisis within the order that challenged the nature of Franciscan identity itself. And as the friar scholars developed their analyses and their arguments on the question surrounding Franciscan poverty and the human will, they emphasized its importance and began to identify a deeper dimension of freedom. For you see, for Franciscans, everything depends upon our power of choice, our will. So as we trace out the reflection on the will and human freedom, I hope we'll see that the backdrop for this reflection and debate is not reducible to the difference between Augustine and Aristotle. It is quite simply the question that was theirs. How best to follow their founder, the poor man of Assisi, and how best to remain faithful to their own spiritual identity. And so the evolution from free choice to freedom that I pointed out a moment ago can be seen to come within a context of the Franciscan spiritual and intellectual effort to reclaim Assisi. That is, to recover and reclaim and defend their spiritual identity by focusing on evangelical poverty. And as we trace out moments of evolution in this debate, I hope we can see the power of their spiritual identity as it influenced the questions they considered, as it influenced the intellectual resources they brought to bear, and how their intentional fidelity to Francis of Assisi made all the difference in the arguments they used. So now, let's set the scene. Francis of Assisi died in 1226. The 13th century, then, is the first critical century of the order's existence and growth. During this time, many university intellectuals joined the friars. Among them was the important master Alexander of Hales, who held the regent chair in theology at the University of Paris. 
When he entered the Franciscan order, the friars inherited a chair in theology that they continued to pass down to master after master. Alexander and his um, working group composed an important summa that is called the Summa Hellensis, and it sets in place the very first inherited understanding of free choice in the will, that's liberum arbitrium, as a faculty of reasoning and willing. With Alexander's entrance into the order, the friars now became much more influential at the University of Paris and elsewhere, and increasingly throughout the 13th century. This caused some consternation among the secular masters who were diocesan priests teaching also at the university. Things began to heat up mid-century with what would become known in history as the poverty controversy. Secular masters challenged both Franciscans and Dominicans to defend their mendicant way of life as validly Christian. They argued, since no one would willingly choose to be poor, the mendicant life of Franciscans and Dominicans was not just dangerous, it was unchristian. The friars begged. They did not work. They were obviously lazy. <laughs> this is not evangelical poverty, and certainly not what it means to follow Christ. So as we would say today, them's fighting words. <laughs> the critique struck at the heart of the friars' vocation, their own identity. So in response to the challenge, Bonaventure of Bagnoregio defended the Franciscan practice of poverty against these external detractors twice, once in 1256 and again in 1269. When you have to defend something twice, it means they're not stopping. <laughs> His defense rested on two distinctions. The first, between voluntary and involuntary poverty, and the second, between ownership and use. As to the first, the poverty of the poor is involuntary. By contrast, the poverty of the Franciscans is voluntary. Second, and this is important for Bonaventure, the friars do not own anything. They merely use material goods for their survival and the works of charity. Now, Bonaventure thought this was enough, but as we shall see, these distinctions did not resolve the issue. They simply brought things closer to home. Because now the debate about the nature of Franciscan poverty moved internal to the order and continued to influence life among the friars, some of whom, who, some of whom saw the distinction between ownership and use a bit too facile, too easily made. One could still abuse evangelical poverty by rationalizing, rationalizing behavior by saying, well, I'm only using this. It really belongs to someone else. If following the poor man of Assisi required radical poverty, others argued, then how could one truly be a Franciscan and give in to the ways of the world? The polemic reached a high point when, thanks to Bonaventure's focus on use rather than ownership, the concept of poor use became central to the debate. Friars debated how might evangelical poverty mean using things poorly or scarcely? And second, is there a deeper reality that makes possible this new understanding of poverty as poor use? Might it be linked to free choice or freedom in the will? 
So what began as an external attack on the Franciscan order suddenly became a touchstone for internal debate and scholarly reflection about Franciscan identity. And the issue split the order into factions. Among these, the so-called spirituals held that true Franciscan poverty called for a far more radical adherence to the life of their founder, Francis, who had nothing. And to this debate, the friar scholars brought a wealth of intellectual tools in defense of their own identity and their own vocation as Franciscans. And one important contributor to this debate was Peter John Olivi. A Franciscan of mid-century, deeply involved in the poverty controversy, Olivi would have a profound effect on his time and influence those scholars of the next generation, such as John Duns Scotus. Now, Olivi is identified by historians as a spiritual Franciscan. And thanks to the work of recent scholars, we've learned a great deal about the historical and the philosophical aspects of Olivi's position on the nature of freedom. Freedom in the will is central to his argument for human dignity, as well as the basis for the position he takes in the poverty controversy. For reasons that are still largely unclear, Olivi was condemned twice. <laughs> You knew this was coming. <laughs> Once in 1283, and posthumously in 1299, right? <laughs> As sort of the over my dead body argument. <laughs> and, interestingly enough, after 1299, Olivi's work could be neither read nor taught. And that's what happens when you ban a book in Boston, right? <laughs> Everybody reads it. So, despite his condemnation, Olivi's influence on the friars was powerful. They did read him. And his role in the development of the notion of freedom and the will arise from his own reflections on poverty, understood as poor use rather than simply non-possession. While non-possession was Bonaventure's central distinction in his defense of the mendicants in 1269, Olivi defends restrained use as an essential element of Franciscan poverty and identity. Poor or restrained use, he argues, requires reflexive self-mastery. And what's more, it requires a deeper notion of freedom that he calls indetermination. And reflexive self-mastery reveals the rationality of the will. So let's take a moment and consider how does Olivi deepen and contribute to this debate about poverty? Well, first, he takes up Bonaventure's distinction between possession and use, and he focuses on poor use as the key to poverty. Following this, he mines earlier source texts produced by Franciscan predecessors like Alexander of Hales. These texts came with the authority of Augustine, who had defined free choice in terms of self-mastery. For Augustine states, quote, nothing is so in our power as is the will, end quote. And Olivi says, for this is freedom, self-dominion or self-mastery. Olivi embraced this emphasis on self-mastery and followed the earlier friars to the affirmation of a deeper dimension of freedom, Libertas, essentially freedom from coercion, which is innate to all spiritual beings, human and angelic. With Libertas, earlier Franciscan authors 
had been able to affirm continuity in the possession and exercise of free choice, which they still called liberum arbitrium, both before and after the fall of Adam and Eve. So continuity in paradise, in the Garden of Eden to today. At, and it's this libertas that is the continuity. At this deeper level of freedom from coercion, which is what they define libertas as, we enjoy the same free choice that Adam knew in the state of innocence, and importantly, that Christ knew during his life on earth. So Olivi brings together this deeper libertas as a foundation for the human capacity for self-dominion or self-mastery. And in his treatise on evangelical perfection, he lays out clearly how the will's foundational dignity and the will's foundational superiority over material influences in libertas are both foundational for his position on evangelical poverty, understood as the restrained use of goods, uses pauper, over and above their non-possession. So the Franciscan vow of poverty, and I hope you're all still with me here, the Franciscan vow of poverty with its essential element of restrained use is no longer simply an imitation of the practice of Jesus and his apostles as Bonaventure had maintained. It is also, Olivi argues, importantly, perfective of all human persons. So I'll say that again, usus pauper, restrained use, Olivi argues, is perfective of all human persons. And in point of fact, Olivi says, usus pauper, the restrained use of goods, defines the highest perfection of Franciscan poverty and freedom. This state, Olivi argues, conforms to the natural human will considered according to its original rectitude. Now the source for this rectitude lies within the will itself. And here it's the deeper freedom from coercion, libertas, whose presence enables the will to master itself. This dynamic power for self-mastery can be experienced by anyone according to two different registers. First, in acts of self-restraint, and second, in our independence from compulsion or coercion. So there's an outward-focused freedom and an inward-focused freedom. Both express, Olivi argues, the will's natural freedom, libertas, and demonstrates a twofold superiority of the human person over the order of nature and all natural causes. For Olivi, our natural state of reflexive self-mastery was lost when innocence was lost. Thankfully, the vow of poverty, now completely identified by him as poor use or usus pauper, provides the sole therapeutic remedy. Poor or restrained use, the practice of Franciscan poverty, enables us to return to our original innocence and rectitude, a state of complete self-mastery, rational with restrained use of the goods of the world. And Olivi defends this Franciscan way of life as that life which helps everyone recover human excellence in all its fullness, its breadth, its length, and its depth. And the truth of these assertions, Olivi argues, is discovered immediately via personal reflection and attention to my inner states. In other words, Anyone, and I think giving this talk during Lent is so appropriate about what, what I'm, because of what I'm about to say. Anyone attentive to an inner struggle to master their desires, to perform a difficult task, or to resist external pressure is immediately aware, he argues, of her innate dignity as a being 
capable of self-mastery. Throughout his argumentation, Olivi appeals again and again to our immediate, existential, and particular awareness of our acts of self-mastery with several concrete examples. And the first is the moment of personal conversion when I love an enemy. It is often the case, he argues, that we experience an act of conversion towards someone who is our enemy. At the moment, they are our enemy. So we don't love them, now we've made them a friend. They're our enemy, and we choose to love them. At a particular moment, we find we are able to love someone we had previously feared or despised. And anyone able to do this, he argues, to refrain from one act, which is aversion to someone we dislike, and to move toward another act, loving that person despite the natural aversion, anyone able to do that possesses the power and dominion over themselves in both modalities of free action, to stop fearing and to turn toward love. In such a case, there is both an initial act of self-restraint, which is a first act of self-dominion, followed by an act of self-movement counter to natural inclinations, which is a second act of self-dominion. This second act, he argues, requires mastery over my appetites and against those inclinations toward which I can restrain myself. And this, Olivi concludes, is what is meant when we speak about the freedom of the will, libertas voluntatis, the freedom to love my enemy. It is a freedom to follow the gospel mandate of forgiveness. Such capacity for self-restraint, he affirms, is the most certain and evident, is most certain and evident to anyone attentive to their inner states. And this capacity depends upon the deeper capacity for freedom from coercion that constitutes the natural dignity of the human will. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. Here is Olivi's argument for self-mastery. It is based upon immediate self-awareness and reflection. But how does he do more than just affirm the existence of a deeper freedom that he uses to explain the self-mastery required? Well, you'll be happy to know, here's where the angels come in. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you were wondering. Yeah. <laughs> Olivi reaches into the tradition to identify a minor detail found in earlier Franciscan texts, which was the analysis of angelic choice at the moment of their creation. We, like the angels, are spiritual beings. We possess a freedom from coercion, from external determination. And this freedom is libertas, a deeper freedom it undergirds the act of choice to explain how, at the very moment of choice, I am aware that, at that same moment, I could have chosen otherwise. The existence of this deeper freedom tied to our nature as spiritual beings explains this immediate act of self-awareness. He says, he would say, if it weren't there, we wouldn't notice it. Free choice, originally identified as an act of self-mastery by Olivi, now reveals that deeper freedom, libertas voluntatis, which is independent from coercion. The debate about the nature of Franciscan poverty, where, where our story began, now reveals that poor or restrained use depends upon a deeper spiritual grounding of the very freedom we share with angels. Olivi's focus on the freedom of the angelic will demonstrates 
how important his defense of freedom at the moment of choice is for his defense of vowed poverty, Franciscan poverty, as poor use. Paying close attention to this act of self-awareness offers the deepest and most evident proof that we ourselves are, like the angels, capable of acting independently of external determination. And this freedom in the will he calls indeterminatio, undetermined by anything else so that the will can determine itself. But this deeper freedom is not only revealed by my ability to love the enemy. It is also and importantly revealed, Olivi argues, in the most important of human actions, loving with a love of friendship. When we begin to love someone with the love of friendship, the beloved is loved for themselves alone. In true friendship, the love of possession is replaced by a generous love that expects nothing in return. This love depends upon my ability to consider another person's good before I consider my own. It shifts my attention from self-love to generous love. It is the basis for civic friendship and the common good. And like loving my enemy, such an act depends upon the deeper existence of libertas, a freedom from coercion or external determination. As the earlier Franciscan masters had done, Olivi highlights our rational capacity to shift from loving something or someone according to the category of benefit for myself to the higher category of intrinsic value. Recognizing in another a value beyond myself requires that I have access to this higher order of value. It also points to my capacity to restrain and regulate myself relative to the two orders of self-benefit and intrinsic value. The order of value where we discover true justice is accessible to those beings who are equipped with freedom. This type of freedom, both freedom from and freedom for, constitutes the dignity that is ours. And Olivi reiterates what is at stake here. It is not simply the ability to love goods of intrinsic value for their own sake. Rather, it is my ability to restrain myself from one way of loving someone to move toward a more generous way of loving them, to love certain goods in a new way or a different way. And this is an act of conversion, a conversion in love. And as I was writing this, I was thinking of that great movie, Bill Murray's movie, um, Groundhog Day, where you see he actually goes through the transformation that Olivi's talking about. I think it took a long time, but he made it through. <laughs> so without such freedom in the will, which Olivi, interestingly enough, he calls it both liberum arbitrium, he calls it both free choice, and he calls it freedom of choice, libertatem arbitrii. If we didn't have it, he argues, no friendship, whether among humans or with God, would be possible. Human society, as well as religion, would be impossible, as would solidarity and commitment within voluntary human associations, such as religious orders, whose members profess poverty. Indeed, without the will's freedom, Olivi argues, we would be nothing more than intellectual brutes. And Olivi concludes that no one of sound mind would dare conclude to the pessimism and the intolerable falsehood by denying the will's freedom. You know, I, I won't address the, the issue of artificial intelligence, but there's a real argument here against any consideration that artificial intelligence is anything other than artificial. 
It's not rational because it's the will that's rational, and we'll see this um, as we continue. So Olivi's arguments illustrate how the poverty controversy, which began with an external attack on the Franciscan way of life and continued to an internal debate within the order, opened the way for a deeper reflection on the nature of free choice and the conditions that make it possible. These conditions include both innate capacity for self-mastery and the deeper dimension of freedom, libertas, we share with the angels. So by emphasizing poverty as poor use, usus pauper, and not simply non-possession, Olivi was able to analyze acts of self-restraint and recast freedom as the most rational element in human nature, and importantly, the condition sine qua non for following the gospel, the gospel command to love our enemies and to love one another as we have been loved. So in defending his own Franciscan identity, Scotus both, or excuse me, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Freudian slip there. Olivi both. <laughs> Olivi both affirms human dignity and holds up the ideal toward which everyone, not just friars, should strive to recognize and experience fully the deepest freedom we share with angels, libertas, with Jesus Christ and with Adam and Eve prior to the fall. <laughs> I have to say, you know he would show up. Olivi's work inspired that of John Duns Scotus, who takes up the argument for self-mastery and uses the same case of angelic freedom to explore more fully our experience of self-mastery. Now, unlike Olivi, Scotus argues that we have not lost the capacity for self-mastery through the sin of our first parents. Now, with his claim, that we possess a native capacity for self-mastery or self-restraint required for the vow of evangelical poverty, uses pauper, Scotus begins to search more deeply to uncover the metaphysical conditions within reality that make this native capacity possible. And he finds these conditions in an unlikely place, Aristotle's metaphysics. He uses the Aristotelian text to identify and defend a deeper freedom at the heart of reality, all created by God. And Scotus argues that there are only two fundamental causal realities, nature and will. Nature causes automatically. Will causes freely. In this way, I hope we can see how Duns Scotus grounds metaphysically what Olivi had defended by means of immediate self-awareness. As Olivi did not, Scotus draws heavily on Aristotle's distinction between rational and irrational causes. If, he argues, as Aristotle states, irrational causes are automatic and possess no capacity for self-restraint, then, get ready, the intellect is not a rational cause, and only the will is the rational cause. For the intellect acts automatically, is unable to restrain itself, and moves in a determined manner toward the answer, like a computer program. Scotus, more strongly than Olivi, emphasizes the will the human will as sole rational potency, unlike any other power we possess or any other power in the universe. And like Olivi, Scotus appeals to an immediate act of self-awareness that at a given moment of choice, I might have acted differently or not at all. So the will's indeterminacy its freedom from external coercion 
becomes the foundational piece to the act of self-restraint and self-mastery essential to the Franciscan vow of poverty. So we focused on a particular debate within a particular spiritual family in order to trace and appreciate why the Franciscan affirmation of a will that is rational undergirds the human capacity for self-restraint, ordered loving, conversion, friendship, and generous self-gift. In other words, the energies within our will that make poor use possible also explain self-restraint, conversion, friendship, and generous self-gift. What's more, for Franciscans, these activities just mentioned reveal that it is the human will and not the human intellect that is the seat of what it means to be rational. Our choices, our behaviors, our actions are the locus for rationality, not our capacity for abstract thinking, computation, or processing information. And this final assertion paints a portrait of the fullest realization of the Franciscan and indeed the human vocation. For the friars, the foundations of human dignity, whose discovery was made possible by the poverty controversy, reveal the source of rational self-awareness, self-restraint, conversion, and friendship. So we've seen how an external attack on Franciscan identity and vow of poverty has opened the way for further exploration on human dignity and a will capable of self-restraint and generous gift. The shift to the lens of usus pauper, thanks to Bonaventure's defense of the mendicants, enabled Peter John O'Levy to take up several key elements from earlier friars and deepen them by means of a focus on reflexive self-awareness and parallels with the angelic will. Both the identification of free choice with self-mastery and the affirmation of the continuity among rational creatures enabled Olivi to reframe the question of poverty and Franciscan identity. His focus on the angelic will at the moment of creation opens the context to allow for a shift in the understanding of freedom and its relationship to free choice. And now, and beyond the debate around poverty, this more nuanced paradigm enables Dun Scotus to go even further in his reflection on the metaphysical foundations and rational nature of freedom thanks to Aristotle's causal analysis. This is reason and faith working together. Throughout the tradition, we witness an ongoing search for a deeper explanation to ground this capacity for self-mastery and restraint essential to the Franciscan identity and evangelical poverty. In Olivi, the deeper explanation is found in the analysis of angelic freedom. In Scotus, the deeper explanation is found in the Aristotelian metaphysical structure of rational and irrational causes. The arguments have shifted and gained greater and greater precision, yet all in pursuit of the same goal, to understand and defend the deepest foundations of human rational freedom in defense of the Franciscan understanding of poverty central to their own identity. And so, as we conclude, what can we learn from this extended reflection on a spiritual debate that took place 800 years ago? Is there anything for us today well, I think we can identify three areas for further reflection. First, the Franciscan contribution to our understanding of freedom and its connection to self-mastery and poor or restrained use. Second, 
the importance of existential and spiritual human questions in intellectual inquiry, and third, the overall importance of spiritual traditions in framing and guiding the mind. First, what might the Franciscan vision of human freedom and its link to self-mastery and poor or restrained use offer us today? How might we, too, reclaim Assisi? We live in a world crushed by the overconsumption of, of, of us all and in a society torn apart by division, by tribalism, driven by hate rather than love. The Franciscan reframing of human freedom as self-mastery and restrained use offers us a way to consider human freedom in service to our beautiful earth, our common home. In this moment of global crisis, guided by Pope Francis's vision in Laudato Si and Laudate Dominum, how might we better grasp our rational responsibility to live simply, to consume less, to care for the environment, and to live in solidarity with one another, especially the most vulnerable. Likewise, how might the vision of human freedom that Franciscans offer help us respond to the call of Fratelli Tutti, seeing ourselves and others differently? Might it help us better understand that the rational capacity for conversion offers us all the opportunity to love our neighbors and love our enemies, even when they are still our enemies, people with whom we deeply disagree? How might we reconsider how we view one another? How might our approach to civil discourse be guided by a greater notion of civic relationship and civic friendship? How might we deepen our human solidarity? How might our own self-image be renewed through a reflection on our own agency, our own choices, and our own ability to shift our ways of thinking and acting? Second, when we study thinkers of any historical period, do we see them guided by their own existential concerns? Do we see questions in the abstract? Or can we consider the particular, personal, existential questions that inform the lives of men and women like ourselves? How might we better understand that in every age, ultimate questions like our own ultimate questions drive our inquiry, influence the choice of how best to approach and solve problems and inform our solutions? Do we think of the past as a time, a glossy time when intellectuals engaged in beautiful ivory tower thinking, devoid of any spiritual inspirations or questions withdrawn from the world, outside of conflict and debate? As we consider those questions that matter to us today, might we be more like them than we realize? And finally, how might this particular case of Franciscan spirituality, identity, and poverty inform us about the power and influence of a spiritual tradition like our own in framing, developing, pursuing questions, and guiding the entirety of intellectual inquiry. For what are our questions today? And what are our students' questions? Where might we touch the existential impact? What does the love of learning and the desire for God bring to our lives today, right now, here at Loyola Marymount? Where is our Assisi to be reclaimed? What particular intellectual gifts and spiritual gifts do our traditions, do we all bring to the promotion of justice in our world by the service of faith? As we celebrate this year the coming together of three religious congregations at the foundation of this university, something a number of us witnessed in person, 
let us, let us continue to seek to bring into greater harmony the spiritual perspectives of each tradition in framing, developing, and guiding the intellectual and educational endeavor here for the lives of our students and indeed for the life of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Beth. Uh, what a beautiful and rich journey from Peter John Olive and angelic freedom to overcoming our over, over uh, consumption and divisions and then back right here to LMU and the traditions of our three founding and sponsoring communities. So thank you for that. To respond to Sister Mary Beth, we are fortunate to have Sister Mary Janino of the Religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary and Dr. Nancy Pineda Madrid uh, from our faculty. Sister Mary Janino is a member of LMU's Board of Trustees, the former Provincial Superior of the RSHMs, as well as a former member of their International General Council. She serves on boards for the South Central Los Angeles Ministry Project, or LAMP, and the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking, or CAST, which I think is well known to a lot of us. Her BA in History and MA in Pastoral Studies are from sister Jesuit institutions, Santa Clara University and Boston College, much of her pastoral work has been in leadership, including in various roles for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles and organizations dedicated to social justice work. Nancy Pineda Madrid is T. Marie Chilton Chair of Catholic Theology in the Department of Theological Studies. Her PhD is in Systematic and Philosophical Theology from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. And her Master of Divinity degree is from Seattle University, another Jesuit institution, and she also worked in pastoral leadership for the Archdiocese of Seattle. She has won too many awards to mention, has given lectures on four continents, depending on whose definition of continent you follow. And she is the author or editor of several books and many articles, most famously on the sin of feminicide and on the communal nature of our salvation, which is the topic of the annual convention of the Catholic Theological Society of America this year. And Dr. Pineda Madrid is currently its president-elect. So I'd like to ask our two respondents, uh, Sister Mary, will you be, be first? Okay, you're gonna be first. <laughs> Dr. Nancy Pineda Madrid will be first. Thank you, that was a very, very generous introduction. Thank you so much. Brett, and thank you, um, uh, Mary Beth, Sister Mary Beth, wow, it's stunning. It's like, how does one respond, right? I mean, <laughs> it's just amazing what you've presented. I see the heads shaking. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's such a beautiful work with such depth and insight. Um, your work certainly has helped me to see anew what conversion could mean in my own life, and I'm very grateful to you for that. Sister Mary Beth, you've taken us on a journey which has not only opened our eyes and hearts to the richness of Franciscan identity and spirituality, but also to the necessity of these Franciscan gifts if we are to respond to the existential urgency that marks the questions looming in our time. I will use my response time to walk further down the path that you have set us on. These questions, um, I'm going to respond to, to two themes and present some questions on these themes. The first one, the human will as the seat of what it means to be rational. That really captured my imagination, and, I, and so I want to reflect with you on that. And then, secondly, the aspirational goal of poor use or restraint. Restraint in the midst of our culture of overconsumption. So to my first question, following the path of Franciscan spiritual identity, what would it mean to deepen our appreciation of the human will not, and not the human intellect as the seat of what it means to be rational? 
If we foreground the human will, then we need to consider what makes our conscience our consciousness of and what nurtures the deeper freedom, the freedom in the will that you posed for us. As you have taught us, it is grounded in our independence from compulsion or coercion. Yet thinking positively, what contributes to and grows our freedom of the will and certainly reflection self-awareness of our interiority. I venture though, prior to an act of choice, there is a pause, if you will, a beholding of that which draws us, that which commands our attention, that which stirs our will in a particular direction. This experience might be described as an interior beholding, but not coveting. Is it here in this place of positive tension, meaning interior beholding but not coveting, is it here in this place that we uncover something of the freedom in the will? I want to explore this interior beholding but not coveting. What if we imagine the freedom in the will as a kind of interior beholding but not coveting? To begin, we might consider what moves the human heart. Simone Weil once observed, the soul's natural inclination to love beauty is the trap God most frequently uses in order to win it and to open it to the breath from on high, close quote. Since the inception of Christian theology, the human perception of divine beauty has remained a theological conundrum. In other words, how do we understand the possibility of the human perception of divine beauty in the experience of the beautiful? So I'm turning there to talk about what stirs us before we choose, right? So beauty, um, so in other words, how do we understand the possibility of the human perception of divine beauty in the experience of the beautiful? Beauty is vital to the human condition. Without beauty, the good loses its appeal. The discourse of theological aesthetics is an exploration of the possibility of such perception. Theological aesthetics is not primarily concerned with the principles that guide the perception of the beautiful. That really is the realm of philosophical aesthetics. Nor is it primarily concerned with the nature of divine beauty in itself, namely the doctrine of God. Theological aesthetics focuses primarily on how human beings perceive divine beauty in the experience of the beautiful. Indeed, I'm drawing on the work of many, many US Latinx theologians who've done a lot of work on theological aesthetics, and certainly our own Dr. Cecilia gonzalez Andrew. I'm also thinking of the person that mentored both of us, um, Dr. Alejandro Garcia Rivera, and uh, Dr. Roberto Goizueta, Michelle Gonzalez as well, and some of my own work has moved in this direction. One can also find elements of theological aesthetics in the work of Latin American liberation theologian John Sobrino. Sobrino's contribution is found in his Christological work, in his discussion of what he calls orthopathy, uh, right desiring orthopathy. Uh, we're, well, we're well acquainted, I'm sure, with orthodoxy and orthopraxis, but this third element, orthopathy, right desiring, he invites us to consider what encourages right desiring. The point is not simply the experience of beauty, which of course does encourage desiring, but rather what orients our desires and how they are cultivated in a particular direction, which has more to do, which has to do with, uh, with more than simply an aesthetic experience of beauty. I want to suggest to you today that this line of thought can contribute to our understanding of freedom in the will because it advances a kind of interior beholding, but not coveting, right? That perception is, depends on that. The perception of divine beauty, how we come to 
draw closer to God in the experience of the beautiful, what appeals to us as we make, our, we make choices. So I think that's one line of thought that might build on what you've given us today. My second question, again following the path of Franciscan spiritual identity, what if we embrace the practice of poor use or self-restraint, right, in the midst of our culture of overconsumption? As I think about overconsumption, Augustine's experience of concupiscence in the confessions comes to mind. Augustine railed against and fought his compulsion to devour everything sensual that he found appealing. He lost control of his human will, becoming a slave to his compulsions. In a word, sin. Today, our pervasive culture of overconsumption feeds our compulsions constantly and zealously, whether we realize it or not. Overconsumption has taken on an almost religious quality in our culture. Given the reign of overconsumption, might poor use or self-restraint be thought of in a way that, that, that it's a subversive practice? Could it be a subversive practice, a practice that undermines overconsumption? What would encourage a conversion within us in this direction? A shift in our self-understanding such that poor use or self-restraint would appeal to us. And I want to explore a potential shift in human self-understanding, a shift that begins with our relationship to animals. To reframe how we understand ourselves necessitates foregrounding how human beings are interrelated with non-human creatures as well as with God. And I'm, use, I'm using this because I think in many ways, if we see ourselves in the ways that we're interconnected with all kinds of, of um, beings in, in the natural world, I think that transforms how we understand ourselves as human beings. Indeed, it is to recognize that the love of God, we have to recognize that we have much um, in common with other beings that are non-human, non-human creatures, as well as, um, as our interrelationship with God. Indeed, it is to recognize that love of God requires no less of us. We have to recognize these relationships. For example, San Martin de Porras, who lived between 1579 and 1634, he offers us a hint at a way forward for an imaginative framework. After all, he was known as the St. Francis of the Americas. Recall that San Martin was a mulatto, his father being a white Spaniard of noble birth and his mother a freed black slave. Both of his parents guided his study of the art of healing and medicine. His work in healing benefited many who lived at the margins of society, widows, orphans, prostitutes, indigenous blacks, mestizos and mulatos, as well as animals. A new way of thinking about human beings and other creatures comes into view with an account of San Martin offered by um, Fray Fernando Aragones. He writes this about San Martin. One of the Dominican friars in San Martin's convent walked into a room near the kitchen to find a strange sight. At the feet of San Martin were a dog and a cat eating peacefully from the same bowl of soup. The friar was about to call the rest of the monks in to witness this marvelous sight when a little mouse stuck his head out from a hole in the wall. San Martin, without hesitation, addressed the mouse as if he were an old friend. Don't be afraid, little one. If you're, come, if you're hungry, come and eat with the others. The little mouse hesitated, but then scampered to the bowl of soup from which the dog and cat were eating. The friar who was watching all of this take place tried to speak, but no words came out of his mouth. 
Before his eyes, at the feet of the, Milat, of the Mulato San Martin, a dog, a cat, and a mouse were eating from the same bowl of soup, natural enemies eating peacefully side by side. Close quote. Differences among various animals, among human beings, and truly among all species created by God does not necessarily lead to our becoming antagonistic to one another. For all species shares, share a deeper bond. Writes Alejandro Garcia Rivera, and I quote, we are bound in a common friendship. Each of us is, after all, a criatura de Dios, a creature of God. Our creatureliness becomes the basis for sharing our resources. We all can drink from the same bowl of soup, for we are creatures not of some universal humanity, but of one creator, close quote. By drawing forward this notion of criaturas de Dios, Garcia Rivera invites us to think more deliberately about the ways this idea may suggest a reframing of humanity's relationship to non-human creatures and to the creator. What if being a creature of God was the fundamental self-understanding of human beings? Would this not affirm the deeper bond that human beings share with non-human creatures? Might this give way to an understanding, to understanding our place within the natural world and not apart from it? Might this serve to encourage us in a practice of poor use or self-restraint? That it's not all about me and my kind, it's about who we are together and the who is bigger than simply the human community. A practice of self-restraint. I think this is one piece of it. We need, to, we need to think outside the box and to be imaginative about how we are all criaturas de Dios. And in many ways, the criaturas de Dios, that may sound odd to us who are primarily English speaking, but in Spanish, the phrase criaturas de Dios is used all the time. And often you will hear mothers refer to their children as a criatura. And so, well, human beings are, are understood as creatures alongside many other creatures in this world. And I think that can function, that idea, that image can function in a way to support a subversion of our, of our drive at overconsumption. So I will close with that. Thank you very much for your attention. I was humbled to be asked to respond to Mary Beth's presentation as the world of the academy is beyond my recent experience. Mary Beth, a renowned scholar, known for her profound thinking, which she aptly demonstrated this evening. I appreciated her many insights and the opportunity to reflect on the transformative power of spiritual identity, particularly in light of reclaiming Assisi which I believe can be influential in shaping a spiritual identity capable of transforming our world today. Mary Beth references the 13th century Franciscan dialogue on evangelical poverty as an example of shaping Franciscan spiritual identity. This dialogue led to the exploration of freedom and will and delved into the relationship between rational inquiry and faith. Notwithstanding, poverty, as in restrained use, is a constitutive element that most would identify with Franciscan spirituality today. Other elements that one would clearly associate with Franciscan spirituality would be praise for the beauty of creation and celebrating the harmony of the universe. Seeing God's goodness and encountering God in all creation, acknowledging the relationship 
and interconnectedness of all. Following the gospel of the self-emptying and compassionate Jesus, the commitment to justice, service, and solidarity with the poor, as well as the virtues of simplicity, humility, joy, and gratitude. Reclaiming these aspects from Assisi and allowing them to influence our spiritual identity and lives could be a tremendous power for change. It is not widely known that the religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary in the West were different from our sisters in other parts of the world. We were first introduced to theological studies through a Franciscan lens. In other areas, it was the Jesuits. Our initiate was in Santa Barbara, and the Franciscan fathers were our professors and chaplains. Their spirituality and worldview resonated with our charism and mission, influenced the shaping of our spiritual identity. The Jesuits and Ignatian spirituality played a significant role in our continuing education and ongoing formation. In her text, Mary Beth reminds us that spiritual concerns are existential concerns. She refers to Bonnie Kent's challenge to historical philosophers to enlarge their context and expand the narrative when developing insights around key human questions. I recently read a book, Dancing in God's Earthquake, which invites us to be open to a transformation of thought, an examination of faith that leads to action for justice. Reminding us of the context during which the sacred texts were written and religious practices emerged, Dr. Arthur Ocean Waskov addresses the critical issues of today and invites us to reframe key human questions for our times and to embrace a spirituality that leads to the transformation of institutions and systems. Do not let disruptions hinder us, but to stay with the struggles and dance in a world infused and pulsating with the breath of the Holy One, a world of love, justice, and peace. I mentioned this book because I think there have been earthquake moments that have called us to conversion, called us to enlarge our context and expand our narratives. They have been powerful in transforming our spiritual identities. I think the case of evangelical poverty that Mary Beth cites was an earthquake moment for the 13th century Franciscan community. The dance moved led to the dance moves led to a vision of freedom and understanding of will, affirmed the human capacity for self-restraint, conversion, friendship, and generous self-gift, foundations, Mary Beth notes, for human dignity. For the church, Jesuits, RSHM, and Sisters of St. Joseph, Vatican II was an earthquake moment. 60 years later, we still feel the aftershocks. Religious congregations were asked to reflect on and return to their roots, charism and mission, to respond to the needs of the times, to make the joys, hopes, griefs, and anxieties of the people of God, especially the poor and afflicted their own. All aspects of our vowed life were examined given this charge. Many changes took place that were unsettling, like digging through the rubble of an earthquake in search of light and life. We were able to enlarge our context, expand our narratives, consider existential concerns, and enabled to move forward in our faith journeys because of the transformative power of our spiritual identity. And as with the dance, we took step forward took steps forward, backwards, and circled around, but did so to the music that resonated deep within our being, a song of faith, hope, and joy, a Magnificat. Reclaiming Assisi and the transformative power of spiritual identity can be seen in the witness and priorities of Pope Francis. 
His writings, The Joy of the Gospel, Laudato Si, and Fratelli Tutti, and in his call to cultivate a culture of encounter, along with the invitations of the Synod on Synodality, reflect a spiritual identity rooted in the gospel, a lived experience of God, and values identified with Assisi. We see in his pontificate an emphasis on encountering God in all persons and situations, appreciating the beauty of creation, and taking responsibility for our common home. The call to embrace all as brother and sister, expanding the human community to the exclusion of none. Listening deeply, entering the dialogue, allowing ourselves to be influenced by the other, building relationships and bridges of friendship that close the wide divides among us. He invites us to walk together, firm in faith, at the service of justice. Simplicity, humility, integrity, love, mercy, faith, hope, and joy, values that we are urged to cultivate are readily identified with Francis and Assisi. If these qualities shaped our spiritual identities, what power we could re unleash for the transformation of the world. Not without controversy, Francis has created shockwaves in his efforts to reform systems and examine long-held notions and mores within the institutional church. He has not shied away from broadening the context or addressing and facilitating dialogue around the key human questions of our times through crying all that diminishes the face of God revealed in creation, the human person, and community. Injustice, war, violence, poverty, while at the same time promoting justice, peace, reconciliation, compassion, and life with dignity for all, lifting up the role of women in church and society. With steadfastness, grace, and dignity, Pope Francis takes those intricate, artful, captivating, and some type dramatic, sometime dramatic steps that are akin to the dance of his native Argentina to lead and lend direction in these complicated and challenging times and does so with joy. We too at LMU have had our earthquake moments. 50 years ago, Loyola Marymount, excuse me, 50 years ago, Loyola University and Marymount College merged to form Loyola Marymount University, not only bringing women to the campus with different worldviews and perspectives, but bringing together traditions of education and the charism, mission, and spiritualities of three religious communities. Attentive to the signs of the times and with an expanded vision for Catholic higher education, Sister Raymond, Mother Felix, and Father Casasa undertook a bold and risky venture they would, that would prove to be the first for Catholic higher education in the United States. This endeavor worked and continues to work because of the complementarity and harmony of the educational traditions and the spiritual traditions education and spiritual traditions of the three commun religious communities. Adherence to our Catholic identity, commitment to the Catholic intellectual tradition, and the integral, de integral development and education of the whole person, respect for the role and leadership in w of women in all disciplines. The tradition welcomes and embraces diversity while holding the unique and intrinsic value of each person, seeks to cultivate a global perspective and encourages the service of faith and the promotion of justice, educating women and men to have compassionate minds and intelligent hearts. Mary Beth poses thoughtful questions to the Loyola Marymount community. I propose that we look to the spiritual identities of our religious communities as a framework for reflecting on them. Though we may have our unique ways of expressing our charism, mission, and vision, 
all of which shape our spiritual identity, the common threads are woven from the Ignatian tradition. Our spirituality are grounded in the knowledge that God is with us, alive and active in our world, to be encountered in all creatures and discerned in everyday life. We are called to know and love God, to make God known in love, to experience the transformative power of God's love, and to bring people to union with God and one another. Our spiritual identities and values are deeply rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ, who we are called to imitate and to cooperate with in the work of redemption. We follow Jesus' self-emptying love and the example of his zeal in bringing about the reign of God, responding to the needs of our times and working with others in actions for evangelical justice. We are women and men for others, hearing both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor responding and doing all for the greater glory of God. Contemplatives of an action who are open and receptive to the movement of the spirit in our lives and the world, prophetic in denouncing all that is not of God and in announcing the good news. In the church for the life of the world, we serve with creativity and fidelity. We embrace all people God's children and our brothers and sisters, caring and acting, excuse me, caring for and acting on behalf of the poor, vulnerable, and marginalized, standing with and allowing our lives to be touched by the least. We hold to the gospel values mentioned and to an inclusive love that invites all to life in its fullness. Community, prayer, discernment, theological reflection, and the Eucharist are integral and sustain our spiritual lives. These spiritual, excuse me, these spiritual traditions support and fuel our passion and the quest for bringing what is good, right, and just into our universe and in our desire and effort to see our world transformed into what fully reveals the reign of God to set hearts on fire, the world ablaze, to ignite a brighter world. I believe our educational traditions and spiritual identity can serve to inform the intellectual inquiry, shed light in understanding freedom and the exercise of will, and break open opportunities for generous self-giving. I hope they will support those who seek the Holy One in everyone and everything who desire to put themselves at the service of faith and justice, and who use their gifts and creative energies to build the world of God's dreams. In those earthquake times, may they ground you, fill you with joy, and inspire you to choose the dance. I do not have a dance movement for this uh, moment. I suspect it will unfold. I am confident, though, that Krista Silva will score the music. <laughs> Sister Judith will choreograph the steps. Leon Weavers will fill the stage with color. John Flaherty will lead the song. And Brian Alexander will ensure that we find delight and joy in the spirit-filled movement. Thank you. Please uh, join me in once again thanking our speakers. Sister and Dr. Mary Beth Ingham, Sister Mary Janino, RSHM, and Dr. Nancy Pineda Madrid. Thank you. Thank you all. I'd like to invite, uh, sorry, I'm charging ahead. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Tracy T. Meyer to present our gift. Thank you. And I would like to invite Mary Beth to come across the stage and stand at the easel with Layla. So as a small token of our gratitude, we would like to present you with a limited edition print of LMU artist in residence, Will Pupa's Veritas Filia Temporis, Truth is the Daughter of Time. Thank you for sharing your time with us and journeying with us to truth.
This concludes our program for this evening. Um, I would like to invite everybody to a reception uh, at the Marymount Institute upstairs. It's on the third floor, more or less directly above us. Just head out that way and up the escalators. If anybody needs the assistance of an elevator, just uh, tap me and I will point you toward it. Um, so we're, we will enjoy the restrained use of some goodies, <laughs> both culinary and literary, and uh, thank you and good night.